Hello, and welcome to day two of EMC Live 2018. I'm Ken Wyatt from Interference Technology, and we sincerely thank you for participating in this year's three-day online event. We have some really great presentations lined up for you. Today's presentation from ITG Electronics is called COTS Filters for Mill Standard 461 Applications, How to Mitigate and select a commercial off-the-shelf EMI filter for mill standard 461 applications. It will run approximately 35 minutes and be followed by a short 10-minute question and answer session. If you'd like to ask questions at any point during the presentation, simply enter them into the Q&A panel on the left of your screen. We'll attempt to answer as many as possible in the time frame allowed at the end. And if you'd like a copy of this presentation, a PDF of today's slides may be downloaded directly from your audience console. Our presenter today is Rafik Stepanian. Rafik is the Vice President of Engineering at ITG Electronics. He has over 25 plus years in engineering, providing EMI solutions for both military and commercial applications. Without further ado, I'm pleased to turn it over to you, Rafik. Thank you, Ken, for introduction. Um, as Ken mentioned, our uh, presentation today is about cut filter and selection. So before uh, we start with cut filter, uh, let's identify EMI noise and the generators, EMI noise generators, and talk about EMI. Performance degradation in any electronic system caused by electromagnetic disturbance. What I mean by that is any device, electronic device, that turns on and off at a certain rate has the potential to generate EMI noise. For example, electronic switches such as IGBTs, TriX, used in electronic control and power supplies, inverters, etc. The levels of the noise are dependent on the switching frequency. There are two means of uh, noise propagation. Uh, one is conducted, which is through power leads entering and leaving the equipment, and radiated, uh, which is emitted directly from equipment or by the leads entering or leaving the equipment. The conducted emissions uh, can be the common mode which is between live and neutral to ground, or differential mode, which is between live and neutral. The EMI noise generators uh, can be either natural or man-made. The natural, for example, is lightning and terrestrial, which is solar system. The man-made are power supplies, electronic equipment, alternative power, solar and wind. Also these days, uh, smart houses, and smart cars. <clears throat> now, EMI is normally ignored during the product design because usually it is not a management management priority because it is, has no perceived value, nor it is a product feature. The, and it is seldom established and it's not it's seldom established as a design criteria. EMI standards um, do not provide guidelines for compliance unlike safety standards. The absence of EMI support structure, what I mean is uh, not many companies have dedicated EMI engineers or they have or they have uh, shielded rooms or equipments to do EMI testing. So the EMI solutions, also they're based on need and not want. And most times it's a 911 call for EMI solution provider. What I mean is the customer is in a lab, EMI lab, the system fails and there's no readily available solution. This is when companies like us get the 911 call and we are asked to supply a cuts which uh, spells out commercial off-the-shelf filter 
that will pass the mill standard 461 emissions and also passes the environmental requirement. And um, also it should be as cheap as possible since EMI was not in their plan nor budget. Um, even though EMI is known as black magic, it can be mitigated by following uh, simple design guidelines during the product and or PC board design. So where possible, isolate the noisy components in one area, preferably in the center of, a, of the PC board, away from edges of the PC board. Keep traces as short as possible and avoid loops in traces Use deep coupling capacitors. Um, round off the corners of the traces that carry high frequency. Design multi-layer boards with uh, sufficient ground planes in between and connect all those ground planes together. One thing that we normally tell our customers are do not daisy chain ground wires. Have one common point and make the ground wires as short as possible because the ground wires in high frequencies they become inductor and generate uh, dips and valleys. Use shielded material around the cover and doors. Read the fine prints on your spec and if there's an EMI requirement make sure you leave space for an EMI filter. You might ask how much uh, Space we should allocate. I say, I normally say uh, as much as possible because it all depends on the current rating of the filter and the voltage rating of the filter and also the noise generated by, by the equipment. And perform EMI tests during prototype design phase and last but not least, Select your processors wisely. Now, um, before choosing an EMI filter, there are a few things that you should know. Uh, one is uh, in commercial work, conducted emissions measurements start from 150 kilohertz to 30 megahertz, and in some cases higher than that. And the emissions, uh, the radiating emissions starts from 30 megahertz and 300 megahertz and up. Now in military world, the conducted emission measurement starts from um, 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. And the radiated emissions start from 10 megahertz to one gigahertz. And these days they can go up to 20 or 40 gigahertz. Now, custom, custom off-the-shelf filters are designed with more differential mode components to be effective and provide more attenuation at lower frequency. The, uh, we, again, if possible, perform an EMI test in an EMI lab um, or in-house and pass or fail save and print the test results. Perform a common mode noise uh, test and save again, save and print the test results. Record the fail points starting from lowest frequency and corresponding dB value above the limit line. If the um, failed frequencies are at or around 150 kilohertz, um, you can you can start or you can choose a um, simple L or Pi configure, configuration filter. Now use the recorded data, of course, to uh, the dB fre versus frequency, and compare it with the data sheet provided by uh, any filter uh, manufacturer, and choose the filter and install, and repeat the EMI test. If the MI test result improve but fall short, you should know each filter component element in theory provide 6 dB attenuation per decade. And what that means is every time you multiply the frequency by 
uh, 2, you gain 6 dB. Every component, again, uh, provides 20 dB attenuation per decade. That means every time you multiply the frequency by 10. And um, if you double the component value, you will gain 6 dB. And that is true if you if you uh, increase the or double the component, two component values, you will gain 12 dB attenuation. And if you cut the component component values in half, then you will lose 6 dB. And this is when this the re, uh, when uh, this is when you have too much attenuation, which uh, in um, you will you can cut the component values in half and lose 6 dB. This is that uh, when um, you have a high current uh, equipment and uh, the components become too large and you have enough attenuation, then you can cut the component values down. Now, each additional component added to the filter circuit increases the attenuation by 20 dB. Now that we know all this, uh, let's see what what is it required for a filter engineer to start designing a filter. Of course, in, in, uh, first thing to know is the voltage rating. Is, is it AC or DC? If it's AC, is it a single line or a three phase, or is it is it the power line frequency 50, 60, or 400 hertz? Of course, we need to know the current rating. Um, the single or three phase is if it's a three phase, is it a Y or delta connected system? We need to know the leakage current. Um, actually, in both military and commercial, there's always leakage current requirements. So that's very important to know because that determines how much capacitance um, can be connected to ground to uh, mitigate common mode noise. The available volume, which we talked about earlier, <coughs> mounting means, which means is, can we use a bracket or we have to use inserts? or any other means that possible. The terminations, uh, input-output terminations, uh, is it a fast on, screw top, milk connector, et cetera. Of course, we need to know the environmental requirements. Um, is there shock and vibration? Uh, what's the operating temperature and so on and so forth? Uh, radiated emission, uh, required attenuation. Now, this is something that normally it's not available, but if it is, we would know. We would like to know the um, dB value versus frequency, or if you have test results from uh, actual testing without a filter installed, that's very helpful for us to recommend or somebody who's choosing a filter. It's uh, important to know. Now, the cuts filter, as I understand. Unlike the off-the-shelf filters, Hutz filters should operate at at or around minus 45 to 85 the ambient temperature. Um, it has to um, operate at 50, 60, or 400 hertz power line frequencies, which sometimes, most times, the uh, commercial, the off-the-shelf filters, they're not uh, rated for 400 hertz. It has to operate at harsher electromechanical environment required by military standards. And all in the meantime, it has to provide higher conducted common mode attenuation at 150 kilohertz, higher differential mode attenuation at 10 kilohertz, because as we mentioned earlier, the commercial and commercial world, uh, everything starts at 150 kilohertz. It has to provide isolation between input and output termination for to prevent crosstalk between them, and maintain its attenuation and shielding effectiveness up to and above one gigahertz, which means <clears throat> both common mode and differential mode components should be incorporated in the filter circuit. If um, depending on the how high of a frequency. Uh, we need uh, EMI needs to measure it, and we recommend, it is recommended to use feed-through capacitors to be installed uh, 
into the filter instead of lead it capacitors to ground. Filter box should be welded construction to withstand shock and vibration. And also it has to be sealed to prevent moisture, to keep moisture out. Now, um, cut selection. During product design, review the EMI requirements before uh, hardware selection, review component specification and choose with respect to EMI. Review mechanical layout of the components that you use in your product and position them on PC board with respect to EMI. Now, after product design is completed, perform, we strongly recommend to perform EMI tests on prototype filter. Review the test result and select the filter and repeat the EMI test. Uh, tune the filter if necessary to bring the product into required EMI compliance um, with at least 6 dB margin. And perform final EMI test on first production unit. Once uh, the design is completed, um, Finalize and maintain product engineering documents after the final EMI test. And any changes made to the original product design, no matter how minor it is, repeat EMI test to confirm compliance. Now, even though uh, Milstana 461 um, clearly specified the uh, conducted EMI susceptibility and radiated emissions requirement limit. Uh, it also provides the limits for each test. And um, also it provides you the um, test setup. One thing it won't and can't specify is how much noise is generated by the DUT to choose a proper filter. To choose a proper filter, one should know the noise level generated by the equipment, then choose a filter that works and also is not over over underrated and it's costly. So in a real scenario, a unit is sent to a lab for EMI test. After setting up the test equipment in a shielded room, the first test performed is a, is to measure the shielded room ambient noise using resistive load. As you can see here, is a load connected which draws um, the um, rated current. And once that's the test is done, which is a C102 testing, the test result should look something like this. And it should be at least 10 to 20 dB uh, this is the test result. It's, it should at least be 10 to 20 dB, dB below the limit. Once that's complete, once this test is completed, then they replace the resistive load with actual uh, unit on the test, which in this case we'll call it a DUT. Once that's connected, then you do the you do an EMI test to measure the noise that the DUT is generating. So as you can see here in this slide, the, you know, the noise generated by DUT is way above the limit with a great margin. Based on the test result, uh, a um, and uh, comparing the test result with different filters, a unit is chosen. In this case, it's an ITG, ITG filter. And the filter is installed between the LISN and the unit on the test. Now, this is this, what the unit which was chosen is a cuts filter. Now, one thing which I would like you to keep in mind is every cuts filter or any, any off-the-shelf filter is designed to provide X amount of attenuation at certain frequency. 
And if the noise level generated by the duty is higher than the filter capability, the, then the filter needs to be tuned. And what I mean about tune is you change the component values and uh, also add components to the filter in order to increase the filter attenuation. Now, as you can see in this slide, <clears throat> the filter, uh, uh, the test result, EMI test result with the filter installed is a considerable improvement, but not quite there yet. There are two peaks. One is at 23 kilohertz and one at 150 kilohertz, which is cut, which is basically above the limit. Based on what we discussed earlier, um, adding a differential mode inductor to the filter circuit should bring this point 23 kilohertz down, and also increasing the common mode inductance should bring the peak at 150 kilohertz consider considerably down. So by by changing the component, adding a differential mode inductor and changing the comma mode inductance slightly, as you can see, the um, test results are, are well within the uh, requirement and the limit line. As mentioned earlier, it's recommended to have minimum of 6 dB margin where possible to compensate for production inconsistencies. Now, we always recommend um, this is the best and most economical path to include EMI solution into a product because the cost of incorporating EMI um, filters increase exponentially as it gets closer to product launch. Because incorporating EMI filters at a later date might cause major electromechanical changes in, the, in, in a system that it might be ready to ship or it's already in production. One other thing that uh, I would like to mention is where to install a filter. Now, the conducted emission test in both military and commercial application is performed in a 50 ohm system using LISN line impedance stabilization network on each power line entering the equipment. So filters are most effective when they are installed at the power line entering the equipment, preferably input terminals protruding out of the enclosure, isolating the input outputs from each other for higher frequency, um, for higher frequency attenuation. The isolating input uh, dirty from the output clean power prevents crosstalk and helps reducing the radiated emissions. Now, keep in mind, emissions measured, no matter how, uh, no matter how, how much is above the limit, it's considered non-compliance. Now, this is a slide that shows the filter is um, installed against the enclosure bulkhead filter. Uh, input, power input, is isolated from output. Now, um, if you remember earlier, I mentioned my understanding of COTS filters. In most military application, the COTS filter mechanical outline does not fit in the available volume. For example, in this case, we were asked to change the filter input termination to a mill connector mounted on a doghouse, which you can see here, and change the mounting brackets. If you remember the earlier box had brackets on both sides to inserts. So this is what the final filter package looks like. Um, it is no long. It is no longer a commercial off-the-shelf filter. It's a custom filter. So in conclusion. 
I have yet to find a clear definition for cuts filters. In most cases, it means a low-cost commercial off-the-shelf filter that meets military EMI and environmental standards. It's a good start, and if you're lucky, a selected cuts filter will work in the application and will fit in the available volume, but don't be surprised if EMI solution evolves into a custom filter because of the specific electromechanical and environmental requirements. This concludes our uh, um, presentation, and thank you for attending. And if the time permits, I can ask, I can take some questions. Uh, hi. Um, yes, there there will be some time for questions. Um, the so. Um, Uh, Rafik, uh, I wonder if you could go back to slide 27. Um, 27. I'm not sure that the graphic, the, the actual plot uh, showed up, and I was wondering if you needed to click something else. Oh, okay. Right there, yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, wait, wait a minute. 25. Uh, go, go, to, uh, go to this one here. Oh, 27. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, there, there. Okay, great. Uh, that, um, at least from my, at my end, uh, did not show up. It was just a blank slide. So, uh, oh. I do want to get that into the recording. And, no, I, uh, I, I yeah, saw it. It was on my screen, so I can explain it again. Uh, oh, good. Okay. Okay. Well, it's probably yeah. an issue just at my end then. Okay. Maybe what so, I want to uh, show do is go back a couple slides to show you the failure, and then explain the rest. This is supposed to go back, but I want to get to this slide. 26. All right. There we go. This slide, when we use the uh, cut filter, and uh, we notice that there is a failure around 20, 23 kilohertz and, 100 and around 150 kilohertz. Based on the previous slides, uh, what was considered here, if we add a differential mode inductor to the filter circuit, which wasn't in, in the uh, cut filter, it should bring this point down. And at 150 kilohertz, um, there were some common mode inductors in the filter chosen. So we thought if we increase the inductance value of the common mode coils based on what, based on the 6 dB uh, uh, gain, if we increase the, uh, the common mode inductor value, it will bring this down. So once that was incorporated in the filter, those two components were, uh, uh, well, common mode differential mode inductor was added, and common mode inductor value was slightly changed. These the test results look like this. So the differential mode inductor pushed this point at 20 kilo, 23 kilohertz down by about 20 dB. And changing the common mode, it pushed this point down by about 10 dB, 10 to 12 dB. Okay, thanks. That's uh, that's quite a difference. Okay, uh, let's move sure. on to the questions then. Um, and if anyone has uh, additional questions, uh, please enter them into the, your your Q and A panel at this point. Let's um, let's take some questions. Um, Amy. Uh, is asking, uh, during the tuning, how are you adding components to the sealed unit? Are you adding them in series <coughs> with the existing well, if it, I'm, I'm assuming? Right. If it's, if, it's, uh, if it's an additional component, for example, the, common mo the differential mode inductor, we were able to add it externally. And 
but increasing the component values, then we have to make a prototype. We have to make a prototype in order to increase the uh, common mode inductor values. But one thing that you can try or can be tried is adding a common mode coil at the output side of the filter. So this way you will, you will know the effect of it. Once you have uh, all the components selected to pass the EMI test, then you can, you can, you have to go back to the filter company and ask them to make a new filter with those components added inside the filter. And Amy is right. If it's a, if it's a potted unit, you can't do anything internally. All you can do is external, adding external components. Okay. Thank you. And, um, Joe is asking uh, what value of differential mode inductor works around 23 kilohertz? In this case, the inductor that was chosen was a 300 microhenry inductor. Now, to for lower frequencies, um, the, normally the, the differential mode inductor values are very small. It can be anywhere from uh, 50 microhenries to three or 500, 500 microhenries. And of course, that depends on the current rating of the differential mode inductor because differential mode inductor sees the full current and the, uh, the coil chosen has to withstand the current without saturation, unlike the mode inductors. All right, and um, let's see, uh, Shafiq is, an, is asking, um, is the ambient noise test really necessary in case of a conducted emission test? As I think that is required for radiated emissions only. Uh, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I like to say, <laughs> no, it's not necessary, but, it's one of the first thing one should do because the shielded room is clean, yes, but the power, depending on what type of uh, power supply it's used, and if the power supply power is not clean, you're not going to get good results. Well, that's a good point. So uh, I strongly you recommend sure your, <laughs> your, your ambient yes. is uh, at least characterized. Just for that reason, some of the labs, they don't like me because I always make them to do the test. And uh, in some cases, we found peaks at certain areas that we could not get rid of. That's why we went back and we, we asked them to do it and they did the test and we find out that the power coming in is the issue, not the unit. Uh, Shafiq is, uh, here's another question from Shafiq. Um, and he's asking, uh, is the conducted emissions test per also performed on signal lines as well in the in the mill standard testing? Uh, again, it all re de de depends on the requirements. I don't, I haven't, I haven't asked, or I haven't seen any requirement for signal lines, but it all has to do with the application. Right, okay, makes sense. Um, okay, here's another question. Uh, do COTS filters need to be UL certified? In 99.9%, .9 no, because... For military use. Military does not require, because they have a higher requirement than UL, and keep in mind, the uh, UL requirement is mostly safety. And uh, based on the requirements on, on military specifications, the safety is included there. So you must go through certain testing to make sure the filter is going to survive. And most of the time, there's a qualification testing that we have to go, uh, one has to go through to make sure the filter is safe and it does what it's supposed to do. Okay, thank you. Um, as long as we're on the, the subject of safety, um, 
how does the maximum leakage current compare between um, military standards and, say, uh, commercial standards? I, I know commercial standards, it's like three milliamps, isn't it? Right, right, it is. But in, in military, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit higher. And I don't have the number in mind, but instead of 0 0.0001 micro, microfarad, for example, you can use up to, depending on application, it could be 0 0.01 or 0 0.02 microfarad to ground. Oh, I see. Okay. There is no, there's no specific, but of course, the, the capacitance value um, will tell you how much leakage current capacitor is going to draw, but I don't have that um, um, current value in mind. Yeah, and I guess the um, if it's uh, alternating current, the uh, frequency uh, depends. It's going to be a factor as well, I suppose. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, I've got one more question here, and uh, if there's any more, we we do have time. For additional questions. So let's take this last question on the list um, from Shafiq again. What is the importance of 100 kil sorry, what is the importance of 150 kilohertz value in filter design? It's an excellent question. Now um, that has come, uh, it's mostly commercial and it comes from Europe. So from uh, questions that are the same questions that I've asked. Uh, they talk about uh, their power line and also the uh, switching frequency of power supplies. Probably at some point it was around 150 kilohertz, and that was that frequency point was chosen by European standards. Now, actually. Um, FCC has done the same thing. Instead of measuring from nine kilohertz, they've they've uh, they've changed their specification, as far as I know, to 150 kilohertz. So it has to do with uh, with switching frequency of most of the supplies that it's being used commercially. All right, uh, we do have a few more questions, and we do have plenty of time to answer them. Uh, Amy is asking, uh, does it matter what the load versus source orientation is for the COTS filter? In other words, can you connect the filter in either direction? Um, yes, you can. Filters work both ways. But also, it depends on the uh, power, in, in the, depends on the units that you're testing. And is it leading, is the power leading uh, or it's the system leading or lagging. In most cases, in some cases, you could have a load which is more inductive than capacitive at the input side. So you want to start with a capacitive, um, with a filter that ends with a capacitor or vice versa. So you have to look at both uh, the product that you're testing and the filter. Because if the filter ends with a with a capacitor, and the product on the test has an inductor facing the capacitor. You adding another section to the to the filter, so you get more attenuation. Right, and I suppose if the filter is symmetrical, uh, then it certainly doesn't matter which way you put it in. But um, that is correct. I, I've seen that is correct. I, I've seen I've seen many filters that are not symmetrical, as you're mentioning, where uh, some right. differential mode capacitor is on one end and uh, that may not work uh, the other direction. Okay, thank you. That's very, um, that's very true. <laughs> uh, Joe is asking, um, do you know of a good quiet 400 hertz power supply? And uh, what he means is um, a lab power supply that could be used um, in the chamber from, from outside uh, from from outside in. In other words, uh, do you know of a good, uh, a quiet 400 hertz power supply that um, could be used as chamber measurement? I would love to say yes, but I, I, for one reason I want to say no is because 
every power supply can, uh, not every, but most power supplies, they come their own filter, filtering system installed internally. But you got to keep in, we have to keep in mind that those filters are designed in a 50 ohm system with a 50 ohm resistor. So in real life, there is no 50 ohms. But the, uh, the rule of thumb is you want to find, you want to get a power supply which has internal filter installed. But with 400 hertz, some, some, one other thing that you have to remember or have to deal with is the harmonics. That you have to make sure the harmonics are 400 hertz or below. Uh, for example, in this case, uh, below the 461 requirements of CE101. So there's a little more involved than just saying this power supply is going to work and it's going to be very quiet. Can, unless you have a different or you have a better idea than that? I'm not sure I have a good answer for that either. <laughs> okay. Uh, I would uh, I would certainly use a linear power supply uh, if at all possible, but uh, you know to generate 400 hertz, you, you're almost um, having to uh, use a switch mode, and I, I guess I would just well, use uh, days, yeah. a a brand that uh, is is uh, from a major power supply manufacturer. Okay, we've got one right. last question, then we're going to wrap things up here. Uh, Shafiq is asking, sure. uh, why is there not why do you not find a built-in differential mode inductor in the filter design? Um, again, most of the most of the off-the-shelf or cut filters are designed for well, not cut filter. I'm sorry, off-the-shelf filters are designed with, uh, for commercial applications. And commercial applications starts EMI measurement emissions measurement start from 150 kilohertz and up. So all the, most of the, and I can say 99% of the off-the-shelf filters do not have uh, differential mode coils, but they have, they connect line-to-line -line capacitors. And the reason there is no uh, differential mode inductors in those off-the-shelf filters because they don't have to, there's no measurements around 10 kilohertz. And also the uh, adding a uh, differential mode inductor to a filter, depending again on the current rating of the filter, it becomes a large, uh, the, the size becomes larger and also the cost is much higher. Okay, good answer. All right. Thank you, Rafiq, for that very informative presentation. All questions submitted will be posted on our website with answers. So if we did not get to your question, you'll be able to find it there. You'll also receive an email with a link to the on-demand version of this presentation within 24 hours. I'm Ken Wyatt from Interference Technology, and we thank you for participating in EMC Live 2018. And thank you all for attending.